So today we are pleased to have um, Brandon Elliott from Northwest Territories Geological Survey, with whom he has been for nearly seven years. Summary. Yep. Um, so the title of his talks uh, reads a summary of the Slave Geological Province Exploration Development Initiative, revitalizing mineral exploration and facilitating sustainable sustainable development in a key economic region. Uh, so for me, the words revitalizing mineral exploration in a key economic region by themselves uh, alert the geologist's um, attention, but more to that, Ballard claims that there is still a potential for a significant diamond discovery. So we're all curious to, uh, to hear about his work and uh, that, um, uh, that he based his opinion on it. And the floor is all yours. You have okay. a 50 minutes for the talk. After the talk, uh, Q&A will follow. Okay. Uh, first off, thanks for inviting me to come here and present about my work, and uh, thanks for coming out to everyone else to coming out to uh, to listen. I'm glad I, I got to do this because my office has been bugging me to put together a summary of what I've been up to for the last five or six years for a long time, and I haven't done it until now. So this is good. So. The title of this presentation is A Summary of the Slave Geological Province Exploration Development Initiative, uh, Revitalizing Mineral Exploration and Facilitating Sustainable Development in the Key Economic Region. Um, it's kind of wordy, that's the title we use for the funding application, so that's what we're kind of running with. And this program's had a few iterations over the last five or six years, and they've all had similar but different names, but it's more or less the same program. So, what this is about is a Canmore funded collaborative government academic industry research program that we've been doing from 2015 till present. Uh, so Canmore is the Canadian Northern Economic Development Agency and this was funded through their Strategic Investment in Northern Economic Development program. And we were working mostly up around here, so I probably should have had a map in Canada, but this is Great Slave Lake. Everyone's familiar with Great Slave Lake. I'm familiar, I, I live on it, so I know it fairly well. Well, at least this part is fairly well. Uh, so we are working up here at 75M and 76C, 76D, and a little bit of 86H, and I think that's, I don't know, 76E, we'll go with that, I could, I could be wrong, but anyway, that part there. Uh, so the overall goals here were to advance our understanding of glacial history and glacial processes in the slave geological province. Uh, we were working with companies and universities to develop some new, uh, new exploration methodologies. Uh, we also were looking, we also were updating superficial maps in some key areas, and we also generated a series of new geophysical data products. So, uh, so why, why were we doing this? Well, um, you know, it's possible that a lot of the easy and obvious kimberlites have been found during the initial few rounds of exploration. Uh, I suspect there's a fair number of them left to find, but as the diamond geologist for the NWT, it's sort of my job to say that, but uh, I actually do think that's the case. So we were looking to generate what we call new baseline geoscience products, new models of glacial processes, new exploration methodologies needed to enable the next round of discoveries. Um, yeah. <laughs> We'll see if that works out for us. Hopefully it does. Uh, but another thing too, just to point out here, is why would you want to work in the slave geological products? It's expensive to work up there, and access can be difficult. Well, according to the databases that I have, we have 354 kimberlites in the NWT. Of those, 21 have been mined or are in a mine plant. That's about 6%. And if you count the kimberlites that are counted as possible ore, that puts it up to 38 kimberlites, which is about 11%. Uh, so you compare that to global averages, and that's quite high. So I guess what I would say is, can you afford to work somewhere else? So things we, other things we're trying to sort of chip away at too is how to best interpret old chem data <coughs> as well as how to plan to collect new camp data. Um, if, it's, uh, if it's not till and you sample it, you're not till sampling. If it's till and you don't sample it, you're also not till sampling. And what I'm getting out of that is that, you know, 
were glacial processes homogenous across the Slave geological province. Uh, that previous figure I showed there, we were working over a very broad geographic area. And when you cover a lot of ground there, it becomes readily apparent that different types of glacial processes were dominant in different areas. So if you apply the same methodologies in each of those areas, they're not necessarily going to work. And so this sort of ties into is, how can you recognize what exploration methodology Method, uh, methodologies are appropriate for the environment that you're in. There's some areas in the slave where it's very conducive to establish a nice ribbon indicator train going to surface and trucking through your tilt column for kilometers. There's other areas uh, where you have kimberlites that have been discovered with no trains whatsoever. Another theme that kept on coming up is uh, how modified are your glacial sediments? And in the seven years I've been working there, I I'm not sure I've seen unmodified till. It's all, all been messed up in some way or other. And before I go any further, I would again like to acknowledge Canor. They provided a large amount of funding for this. Uh, this work would not have been possible without that. Now, I'd also like to thank uh, Dominion Diamond. They provide us with a lot of data. They allow us to use their HW camp. Uh, Kennedy Diamonds, again, provided us with uh, logistical support, let us work out of their camp. Uh, GGL donated a huge amount of data and also let us work out of one of their camps. Uh, North Arrow and Diabook donated data. Um, Peregrine was quite helpful as well. Um, and without uh, the, the, all these generous donations and access to their facilities, this work wouldn't have been possible. Uh, I'd also like to thank Aurora Geosciences. They provided logistical and technical support. They often have many projects on the go, and you know, for example, one field season, I think I saved about 42,000 bucks and just by sharing flights, you know, not counting other logistical savings again. So uh, access to infrastructure, data donations, uh, and sharing logistics with various companies and service providers uh, really helped make this work possible. So I'm gonna break this presentation down into three sections. There's a bit of overlap, but the way I like to see it organized is I'll start first with the, uh, the new geoscience data sets we gathered. Um, or we, we collected and published. Uh, then we'll move on to some of the glacial process studies we've been doing, and then we'll move on to what I call you know, the target discrimination studies, which is sort of the more applied stuff that you could use to help decide is this anomaly worth drilling or not. So I'll start off with the geophysical data sets that we have there. So, and my premise here was that there's areas in the slave geological province where uh, poorly understood superficial geology has hindered drift prospecting. So, okay, so if you're having trouble getting a good clear signal from your tills, well, what can we do to help with that? Well, I thought that maybe if we fly regional scale, uh, 100 meter spaced mag surveys, that would be a very useful product. So in 2017, we flew one down here, that one's about I think 78,000 line kilometers, and we flew a smaller one up here this year. And initially, we were going to try to cover here as well, but we just were able to cover this with the budget and time we had, and we had um, really bad weather for flying this year. And then the, um, the pump at the Avgas bulk storage tank in Yellowknife broke, and it took Shell about three weeks to fix that, so there was very limited ab gas in Yellowknife. Uh, it was actually a bit of a hot commodity. The people that had it tucked away in barrels, I think, were able to, <laughs> able to do fairly nicely on that, but we couldn't get at that, so we had to shut down. And we had, uh, had one I'd never, had, I'd never had dealt with before. There was um, a truck at the airport backed into one of, our, one of the planes, and they had to get a new wing for the plane. So, um, so yeah, we wanted to fly all of this, but after all we dealt with, I was kind of happy to get that. Maybe we'll fly this again some other time. But that's the, the fun of flying geophysics in uh, February and March. So the one down at the south there, this was flown by Eon Geosciences. We flew this in 75 N and N. So there's um, there's Gunner Equator, there's Snap Lake there, so it's sort of covering that area. This one again was 88,000 line kilometers, 100 meter spacing, we flew it 60 meters off the deck, so it is, uh, it's a beautiful data set with sufficient resolution to uh, potentially delineate Kimberlite targets. 
And there's some pictures of it here. That's uh, 10 kilometers there, and that's 20K. So it's a beautiful data set. Lots of nice little anomalies or little circular features coming off of dikes there. I'm not a geophysicist, but some of those in some parts of the data sets look pretty nice to me. And uh, after we released this data, 34 new claims were staked over them. Uh, there was some work done. A lot of those claims have since elapsed. I'm not quite sure what kind of work was done, and I'm not sure if the companies are going to file that work or not. Probably not to lot the claims, but there was some follow-up work done. And this is available as uh, end of the deopen report 2017-14. And then this winter, that's the one we had all the issues with. We flew that survey there. And that one is uh, 65,000 line kilometers of 180, 100 meters space mag. And um, this area here, it's, it's blocked out with a big red blob, but that covers the Point Lake Greenstone belt, so it's not, uh, not necessarily an ideal uh, where you think to look for diamonds, but there is IZOC right there. So the idea is, is that, that um, relatively unexplored and open for staking Greenstone belt with proven mineral potential is, uh, now has a beautiful free data set for you to access if you're interested in working there. And that's available as Open Report 2019-3. Yeah, so there's some a bunch of copper, a bunch of gold, and a few base metal showings along that greenstone belt there, and we've got Isox right there across the border. And there's a nice total mag, uh, total mag intensity image there. <coughs> Something else that we uh, we were working on was generating new superficial mapping products. Uh, for those of you who've worked in the slave up there a fair bit, the, um, the standard, the go-to superficial mapping product there are the, the map series from uh, Ward, Dredge, and Kerr that were produced back in the 90s. And I think they were initially 1 to 250k scale, but they've since been refined to 1 to 125 scale. And, and they're excellent maps for what they are, but they're, uh, they're essentially till thickness inferred from surface textures. So these are, these are great products, but what they lack is sort of the, the genetic interpretation and the resolution that you need to interpret or plan till sampling programs. So we figured this, this program is a great opportunity to start updating the official map, maps and slaves. So we covered this part here back in 2017, I think. And this is one that we're getting produced right now for us. And all said and done, we're looking to, go, when this is all done, we'll generate it around uh, 15,000 square kilometers, covering about 2250k map sheets. So it's a pretty sizable amount of product. Um, and I think, if this sort of work continues, and if there's indications that it might, I would like to start filling this gap here, as well as down here and up and here. I probably don't, I, I don't plan on generating these maps for the, the big east blocks or on the mines. I think they have, uh, I think they have that stuff covered fairly well already. So uh, a little bit more about these superficial mapping products. Um, they were produced mostly from remote imagery, so mostly I think it's one meter satellite images combined with the Arctic DEM. And for those who aren't familiar with the Arctic DEM, it covers all the north. And it's at either 1.5 or 2 meter resolution. And it's a free publicly available DEM, so it's, um, it's, it's a really good product. I will just caution you though, some areas of the NLDT, the DEM looks a lot like uh, dunes. And if you come across that, that was uh, collected in the winter. So that's the images of the snow surface. <laughs> so, yeah, so just be aware of that. Um, we were able to do some field checking. We were able to do about 10 days of field checking for each of those mapping blocks. I would have liked to have done more, but just the logistics on the cost, and, and this kind of the way the funding cycles were working for this stuff. It would have been difficult to implement uh, a large-scale field program to ground truth the map, so we kind of had to choose, do we want to do traditional superficial mapping and cover a small area, or do we want to do these remote maps and cover a large area? And we did these at, I say, 50K scale, so it's probably not detailed enough for property scale work, but it should be at a, at a good enough resolution that you could, it should be able to flag any potential problem areas that you may have in your area. And so they did um, the 1 to 50k superficial maps as well as sampling suitability maps. Mm -hmm. And what those are is you sort of rate the terrain unit from, uh, I think maybe 1 to 5. And it gives you an idea of how likely you are to find, um, to collect a good till sample in there. Uh, it doesn't mean you can't get a good till sample in an area that's red, because um, this can be quite variable, especially at a 1 to 50k scale. 
Uh, but yeah, these are made with you know considering glacial process as well as morphology, differences up there, depending on scale. Um, and these can be used for both planning um, new programs as well as interpreting older sample data. Yeah, they're worth taking a look at, especially for the older Kim data, because as most people here are probably well aware, it's of uh, is collected by many by people with uh, different levels of expertise in it over different times, done through different labs. Uh, so it's a, a variable. Uh, a lot of times you're comparing um, apples to oranges there. So this block up here, this is the one that's getting generated right now. This one's being generated by, uh, it says Palmer Environmental Consulting Group, but they're now just called Palmer. So that's Dave Sacco's group there. And we anticipate getting these out the door uh, probably in May sometime. Um, the idea here was that this is an area with complex sufficient geology and compared to down here, it's fairly relatively unexplored. And I mean, from a simple point of view here, there's some mines here, there was a mine up here. Let's, uh, let's look in there, let's connect it with a line and go in the middle. So, kind, of, kind of only half joking with that. So, uh, yes, we also generate some other products down here in SETI by M and N. Um, this north one up here covers the South Copper Mine train. Um, and these ones here cover the area around there's Snap Lake there and there's Gapture Quay. And the blue ones here were put together by uh, Palmer with uh, Dave Sacco and Brent Ward, being some of the lead mappers on there. And the red ones were put together by Boulder Associates with uh, Vic Lefson and Sonnenville taking the lead on those ones. And these are all available now. I don't think I list the publication. I mean, but they're on our website. If you want to find any of these products, just shoot me an email. I'll help you find them. Our um, our website um, sometimes uh, I'll just plug it for this. Um, <laughs> clients often provide me with excellent examples for off to improve the website. So uh, I just say yes. It's my job to help people get our data. So if you're having trouble, just give me a call. And here are some of these look like. So there are these nice, beautiful, updated maps. And it appears that PowerPoint saved these at very low resolution, so they look like garbage here, but that's OK. And so, and the, the maps that Palmer generated, they also included some <coughs> sort of little figures here showing where uh, erosional corridors are present. And here's a picture of Boulder ones. They're, they're traditional superficial map here, and their sampling suitability map over here. Uh, something else that we were able to um, sort of Get out the door as part of this, this program was a very large amount of mapping data that was very generously donated by GGL. Uh, this was the mapping that John Knight generated while he was working with them. Uh, and it is um, 50,000 square kilometers of 1 to 50k scale superficial mapping products, which is phenomenal. Um, and these, they're not traditional, um, they're not traditional superficial geology maps, but they're more focused on. Uh, Till preservation for drift prospecting and sample collection, as well as the effects of meltwater. So here's a figure showing where all the map sheets are. So if you're working in any of these areas here, this you'll want to look at this product. It's fantastic. And here's a, an example of what this stuff looks like when you actually load up the maps. Another one of the things we did towards the start of the program was we did a 175 hole overburden drilling program in the Lac de Gras area. And it was sort of broken into three components. The first one here was we put about 94, 95 holes down ice of DO27 and DO18. And the idea here was to put together um, a really nice 3D model of a complex um, Kim train, so in 3D. And it was sort of, you know, it's kind of building on, on the Ranch Lake model where you have that nice, nice, almost, you know, say, textbook uh, example of an indicator train here. It's a lot messier, so I think this is a, another end member of what you can expect to find in those systems. And this one here was a, a, sort of a semi-regional study of the copper mine train to try to better understand uh, you know, the glacial processes going on in this area and why you have some of the trains in the area, the monument train, are quite clear back to the source, and other ones, the copper mine train, remain a little more enigmatic. And up here, we were trying to do more of uh, a regional study for till stratigraphy. Um, and this, a lot of this drilling here is for an associate of permafrost study. They won't be going into here. But I've been told it's a really, 
Control is one of the most high-tech, fancy permafrost monitoring networks in the world. Uh, but here's where we wanted to study some of the, uh, the deeper uh, the deeper hum of details up there on the dive that leads. We're trying to see if we can find evidence for a stratigraphy or maybe there's something a little bit at the bottom. Uh, but unfortunately, we kind of ran out of time and money there, and we weren't able to uh, do as much work as we would have liked. Uh, we used a North Span Hornet. Um, for those of you who have used those rigs before, I, know, I, I think this one was great. It wanted to work. It drilled really well. Uh, behind the snow cat, some days we were getting uh, you know, 11, 10, 11, 12 holes per shift. These were short holes, a short distance travel, but the machine was great. The only issues we had with the machine were pretty much my fault, I think. Um, when the drillers say the snow cat is overdue for maintenance, what they mean is that it's overdue for maintenance. Uh, they don't mean send it out for another couple days of drilling to try to wrap up that part of your program, because it broke down and froze solid on lack of grunt. And uh, that was, um, took a couple days to sort that out, but it uh, wasn't a huge deal in the end. And then for the second half of the program there, we started moving this with a helicopter, which isn't nearly as efficient. And due to the length, the lengths we were moving it, the drillers wanted to have their winter, winter survival gear at both ends of the move. And so that's a survival shaft plus their other survival gear, which was, which was two hops for each set of equipment. So I think when all was said and done, it was taking like 10 or 11 hops to move this unit to the next hole. So our uh, production decreased uh, rapidly when we did that. And in retrospect, after the first couple of holes of that, I should have switched right back to this unit and uh, certainly to get more production. But uh, I guess, you know, lesson learned. <coughs> so here's just an overview of the results. Um, I like putting these up there because we get a lot of indicator minerals. So the government has confirmed there are indicator min mineral accounts in the lap de gras area. So here's your tax dollars at work. But no, I, I like, I actually like this a lot because uh, before I, I joined the government, I was working in nickel exploration and I spent years chasing dog after dog <laughs> garbage for results. So it was, it was quite nice to see good results, even if we, we kind of knew they'd be coming. So here are the total Kim counts for the drilling air, for the air that we drilled here. So obviously you expect <coughs> some high counts uh, down nice at DO27, DO18, you expect high counts up in the Academy block. But we also saw with some pretty high counts here, sort of on, you know, on par with the, um, the, the hits you get from the Academy block there over in the copper mine train there. And um, these numbers here are just the, 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 the entire length of the hole is summed up as one. I don't have the software or the technical know how to plot these properly as borehole traces. So, and I made these figures about four years ago. So, yeah, so some pretty good Kim counts out there. So, you see, you see the same with Pyrox, some really nice hits out there as well. Um, yeah, keep in mind this is uh, 151 to 8,600. That was one of our hottest holes there. Uh, you get moving for Calipite rims again, you're still finding an anomalous amount of them out there, which is pretty cool. And this one I like a lot. This is a little harder to see. But what we have here is a number of G10Ds. So there's your G10Ds from the caddy block. There it is from the entrainment study. We're getting you know three to four G10Ds, those yellow holes, sort of out there. So that that is, that's a nice area. Again, same similar pattern in the chrome biopside data as well. And uh, that's same with total olivine. Though I don't, I don't talk about it much here. The we have a master student working on this area. Uh, out of Waterloo. He started in 2015 and he's been working for a while, but he is almost finished writing now. So I'm looking forward to seeing what he was saying. But um, years ago, he was suggesting that the copper mine train may just be a pamphlet sort of situation there where it's basically the monument train gets pushed down one ice advance and then moved up this way. Um, I don't think that's the case just because if you plot that data up, there's way more chrome diopside here than here, and the concentrations of Kim's overall are comparable. And I have a hard time thinking of it of a, of a dilutive erosional process that's going to maintain your concentrations while increasing your proportion of chrome diopside. Okay, so total olivine again, same uh, similar results there. And Kim chemistry is about what you would expect to find in the left or right area, so very nice chemistry. 
So for the regional drilling, uh, overall we saw some strong Kim anomalies at depth that are not reflected in surface data. And these following slides are showing some pyro counts for that. So these are some figures I made years ago. I probably do them a little differently now. But what we're showing here is, it doesn't show up well at all, but here you see these little green dots here. Those are all surface data from the Kim Kimsey database. And they're in the one to 10 count range. And these holes, those there are our drill holes with depths on them. And again, most of the, a lot of those are in the one to 10 sort of range. But these ones here are not. So we have this hole here, this uh, about an eight meter deep hole. On surface, you're more or less in background. But when you get down to about three or four meters, you start getting you know, 50 pyro counts of some of your samples. And this one here, about you know, eight and a half meters. Again, you get down about five or six meters, the same thing. You get a really strong hit of depth that's not reflected in the surface. And again, you see that out a little bit to a lesser extent there. And you know, that hole there is blank. Uh, that next there is, a, I think that's a monoprose drill hole, and I think that is as well. Um, so yeah, there's definitely something going on in that area, but I mean, if you're just looking at the surface sediment, you're not gonna pick any of that up. So I guess the question is, is what, what's going on here? Is this till stratigraphy? Uh, you know, this is the outlet of Black, this is near the outlet of Black de Grasse, so it's quite possible that um, there, you know, maybe this was covered by a lake at some point, so it's possible you had a not insignificant amount of lake sediments on there. And one thing that I think is sometimes underappreciated is the speed at which cryoturbation can happen. Um, sort of, it's a, an anecdote, definitely, but I mean, there's a, a, piece of, a piece of an old pipe or a road sign or something that pokes out from the asphalt on the road that I, I, that I bike on taking my kids to daycare. And in the winter time, it always gets jacked up about that much. And I don't know if it just settles down naturally. The city pounds it with a sledgehammer or something, but this, it shows that you know within a year you can have sort of that much movement in the right environment. And you uh, you know you fast forward for thousands of years, and you know how long until that would homogenize a till column until you can't even recognize it. And I remember when I first started doing uh, superficial geology work, I was having uh, I was trying to figure out like you know. What is a pristine till? Can we find any here? And I, I remember some people were telling me that when you take a till sample, you find that sort of vesicular aragar texture. They were saying that's an indication that's a good till sample. But we were also, I mentioned before, we were doing some permafrost work. And uh, the permafrost people, when they saw it, they said, oh, that's a cryo feature. That indicates, you know, cryoturbation. And they, they have a whole, they, have, they, they know quite a bit about that. So that really kind of got me thinking that, you know, how much of this, how much movement's going on here, and how much stuff on the surface gets brought back down below and churned up with what you're sampling. So, you know, maybe that's what's going on here, I don't know. And uh, this is another another slide showing some of the same area, and I was clearly uh, feeling much more promotional for this one, so they put a nice funnel, put a red spot. So maybe, maybe there's, you know, there's some round lakes, maybe there's some good stuff there, but I mean, here we have this hole here is about a six meter hole and there's nothing at surface, it's dead. But when you get down to your, you know, the, at the five meter area, you're getting, you know, you have 50 pyros. Uh, this one here, at surface, you get next to nothing. But again, you go down the first little bit there and you get 10. Here, you get next to nothing at surface, but you get down about 15 meters and you start seeing these really strong hits there. Um, you know, this is, that's about a kilometer for scale. So this, you know, this is, Obviously, this is a very uh, ambitious, and there's a lot of a lot of geo fantasy in this this sort of this figure here. But I mean, I think what I'm trying to get across is that there's a lot of areas where the what you sample at surface really isn't telling you uh, the whole story. Another thing here too is that you have sent you know a sample here that you know four meter one gives you nothing, three meter one gives you nothing, you know your 23 meter one gives you a really good one. So you know the question that comes to you know. So the question that's raises to me is sort of uh, how do you, you know, you obviously want to get these deeper holes, but how, how do you know when you're you know, gonna, how do you know how deep the till is beneath you? And if you are planning uh, this sort of an overburn drilling program, I, I'd recommend not doing it on the grid. I would recommend trying to target areas of deeper bedrock. No. And I'll just briefly touch on our geochem results here. So here is a cumulative percentage probability plot for the 
the top samples, okay, and there's one to six meter, and there's six meters. So this is sort of strength of an anomaly here. So you can see your deeper samples, uh, your, the deeper till samples statistically have much higher values for geochem, and we see the same thing for chem counts as well. So there's definitely some value in you know, overburden drilling. It's, um, it's certainly an expensive, it can be an expensive way to collect your samples. So in summary, for the drilling results there, uh, snowcat is a great way to do it. Um, this type of drilling is also very low environmental impact. I have pictures from our drill program that I show people sometimes when they're concerned about this type of drilling. It's overlooking the, the valley there down towards DO27 and DO18. And it's, you know, can you see any drill holes here? And they say no. It's like, well, there, there's about 85 drill holes that you should be able to see in this picture. Uh, we actually had trouble finding the drill holes again in the summer because you know, put the pegs down in the snow and they melt up and fall out. But you basically had a hole about this big with a pile of dust around it about maybe that, that sort of extent. So we were trying to uh, find these drill holes and we, so we could set, take some till samples beside them for comparative purposes. And it actually became, it was actually quite a problem. We weren't able to find some of them. <coughs> um, yeah, we found indicator, mineral, and geochem anomalies at depth that aren't seen in surface data. Um, grain size data we got from this, it may be useful for interpreting glacial history, but I mean, it's RC data in like 1.5 meter intervals. So I don't know. You can get something from it, but I'm not sure if I'd uh, rely on that too much. Yeah. So for depth to bedrock, one of the things we also tried was we wanted to see if you could just do a quick GPR survey. Uh, and a quick, uh, this was a resistivity survey to pick up depth to bedrock to help target your overburden drilling. And it sort of works. Uh, it was a little ambiguous. Um, they were certainly able to get very good estimates of it when we gave them the borehole data, that certainly helped. Um, but yeah, it works, it's time consuming. Um, I've had some superficial geologists point out to me since then that it's actually fairly easy to do a product that's like 80% of the way there just by looking at your DEMs and your bedrock data, so that may be a more practical way to do it. But if you're interested in the nitty gritty of this one, it's available as open file 2016-04. Oh, half an hour in, we're on to the second <laughs> portion here. I'll try to speed it up here. So here we're going to talk about some of the glacial process work we did. Uh, one, of the, one of the really cool things we did was we did that 94-hole RC, uh, RC model of the DO27 and DO18 trains. Uh, and there is a paper out on this already. It's Kelly et al., 2019, in the Journal of Geochemical Exploration. And it's the effect of shifty ice flow and basal topography and shaping three-dimensional dispersal habits. So here's how I plotted the data. This is sort of my level on it. So this, this sort of shows here the geochem anomalies. There's DO27, there's DO18. There's pretty good geo, you know, it's pretty simple <coughs> geochem anomalies through there. But what's interesting is when you start looking at your chem counts, there's not a lot of chems right in front of, in some, some cases none, right in front of DO27. They're all on the, mostly along this bedrock valley coming out of, just going alongside DO18 there. And here is a quick look at the geochem data, and this is just a neat way to do it, where you just do a some sort of, what is this here? Um, and I can't read that there. It's some sort of statistical thing that uh, <laughs> Dr. Kelly did. Uh, the, exact one, the exact thing that is slipping my mind. But basically, you plot it like this, and you can see here's your background data. And there you can clearly see where you start getting what we're, what we're inferring to be uh, Kimberlite influence in the geochem data. So what they're looking at is, you know, they're trying to document the role of multiple ice flows as well as bedrock topography and dispersal. Um, so this here is the data from the base of the till column, and there's DO27, DO18 there. So you can see the chromium anomalies are trending clearly westward at the base of the till column. And then when you go to surface data, it's going northwest. What this looks like in 3D here, and this is not showing up well at all on the screen, but essentially it looks like most of the train got funneled along this bedrock trough here, which was not quite what we were expecting to see. And so here is your, the model they came up with, there's your Kimberlite pipe here, there's your older ice flow, there's your younger ice flow, and in the basal till, we were actually seeing what they're interpreting as uh, some 
relict material from the old ice advance preserved in the lee side of a slope. And they also thought they saw a bit of hybrid till there. That one I'm not as convinced on, but this one, we look at the data, seems pretty good. So, to summarize the findings there, they're saying that in areas of thin discontinuous till, compositional variability can be driven by multiple ice flows and it's found both laterally as well as vertically. So, it can be complicated. Uh, so, they said the three-dimensional three distribution of anomalies also appears to be modulated by bedrock topography. So, in some cases, there is definitely an element of bedrock control for where your indicator minerals will be distributed. Um, in areas of bedrock that protect thicker till, uh, allow for, you, you maybe you'll find um, some preserved till stratigraphy there. And this definitely has implications for surface, surface sampling, so you should be considering bedrock topography, till thickness variability, as well as your ice flow direction. So something else that we generated, so moving on to a little different topic here, is we generated a report uh, that Don Cummings put together a summary of uh, sort of the evolution of our thoughts on superficial geology of the slave over the last 100 years. This is a great report. It's available as open report 2018-13. Speaking of Don, uh, for those of you who know Don, Don likes eskers a lot. And, uh, I think eskers are pretty cool to work on too. So we've done a couple of eskers studies with Don. This is the first one here. This is Don and his student Neil, uh, who's working at Carl University. And uh, what we're sort of trying to figure out figure here is when you're working in the slave, is this, uh, is what's more likely short or long distance transport for your kins and eskers? Are you looking at uh, five kilometers or are you looking at 150? And this part of the study was made possible uh, by the very generous donation of Dominion Diamond's LiDAR data set. So for this study here, he was working with, uh, he did field mapping, we, he did, we, did some, we actually did some drilling on the Esker too to get some trigger as well. Uh, he did two kinds of GPR. I don't remember the frequencies, but one of them was about the size of a small vacuum cleaner you drag behind yourself. The other one was a big tail. It was about 10 or 15 foot long antenna you drag behind yourself. And we were told not to break it because you couldn't replace it because it interfered with communication systems for high level intercontinental aircraft or something. But if you had one of these grandfathered, you could still use it. So I, I think they've replaced every part of the system many times, but it, it's, it gave great data. So. And yes, yeah, so the lighter data set, I think it was like, a, like a several centimeter resolution D and with high-res photos, so we were able to uh, put that into a computer and put on 3D goggles, and it was it was crazy. It was like you were there, awesome. And one of the things that's pretty obvious when you fly over there, or sort of the data there, there's pretty clear evidence for repeated episodes of progradational progradational sedimentation, where you go from your um, sort of your 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 armored cobble boulder ridge sort of our channel facies, and you. And eventually that will transition to more your sandy or gravelly flat top ridge. And eventually that goes into these sort of esker deltas where the system kind of blows out. And you'll see this package overlaying on itself, ice tree over the over the area. So to me that strongly suggests that these are being put down in fairly short segments. And here's a, a de some detail there showing some of those deltas there. It's kind of cool. You can kind of see some of that polygonal what looks sort of those cracks there and, and there. Uh, that's those are probably ice core, and that may be related to that. And some of the esker, some part of the esker we drilled, there still was ice in them, which is pretty cool to see. So, yeah, so what they were figuring they have two phases of sedimentation. You have your cobble boulder ridge that's then overlaid by your finer, well sorted sediment. They were uh, they think this, they think there's a pretty strong case for punctuated sedimentation. So the esker is mostly continuous, but the components are not. And these sequences are heat on a kilometer scale, and this is you know, this is interpreted to indicate you're probably looking at uh, short transport for your indicator minerals and your eskers. So it might be you know maybe it's your tilt transport distance plus three or five k. Um, you know, we're not totally sold on that yet, so we're, we're continuing to do more esker work to, to see if we can further this research. And um, they think that some of the superglacial, uh, sorry, that some of the detached esker pads could represent uh, a superglacial component. And here's a cross section across one of those flat top sections, so it's some really nice, uh, nice sedimentation there. 
So, um, so the first study was done in 2015, and in 2019 we're doing the next uh, next stab at that here. So, um, so this is with Grayson Bylock, a PhD student with Don at Carleton, and he's examining the geomorphology and provenance of the Exeter Lake Esker system. So his study area is from the start all the way down there. Um, there was we did a, some detailed work at a zip camp there this summer, and he um, worked with Dave Olson this summer just to collect a try and the samples all along the Esker. So he collected 175 samples over 500 kilometers of Esker. So that's a pretty cool study. So here's sort of showing his uh, sampling grid there, and there's the detailed one at Zip Camp. And this, one of the reasons why we wanted to do this big area is that you know where, where we were seeing what we think is a pretty good case for invoking short transport distance around the Lac Gras area. I mean, here we're going to try to see how far we can document these Changes in bedrock lithology going through the system, so that may tell uh, that may tell a different story than the stuff we did in 2015. Um, and for the detailed sampling work, we sampled the Esker Crest, we sampled adjacent till the Meltwater Corridor, and where we could, we went outside of the Meltwater Corridor up into the Till Plains there. But what we're trying to get a feel for is, do can we trace any sort of anomalies or anything being transported sort of to the Esker and down ice? So try to get more of a local feel for any greater transport uh, distance there. Have another student, um, Patrick Desrosiers at Brent Ward at Simon Fraser. I notice uh, Brent didn't come today. He said he might, but I guess he didn't. <laughs> uh, and so what he's looking at is how do sin and post-depositional meltwater processes affect the camp concentrations? And this work was done in the mud of zip camps this summer. And he was doing field work, uh, sampling, air photo analysis. He built up some. Uh, some DMs and point clouds, stuff out of drone, or using a drone. Um, and something else he was looking at, in, in these erosional corridors in this area, as well as in other parts of the slate, you find these, um, these irregular mound features. Um, they're, they're distinct from eskers, and we don't think they're canes. Um, when I first saw them, I assumed that they were just an erosional remnant of older tills left, or tills left in these erosional corridors. That doesn't appear to be the case. So he's also looking at those to figure out, you know, are these decent sampling media for exploration? Because this is in your erosional corridor here, and you have these little irregular mounds, and you sample a lot of these, so the samples cover up the things there. But uh, these photos, again, don't really show them, but there are these mounds here. Um, and we, I thought I was getting a handle on, on what's going on with them, but we, we dug up one of them this summer, and uh, we're pulling up uh, rounded boulders and cobbles. And then we go to another one that looked identical, about 150, 200 meters away, and it was full of subangular and angular boulders. So when I'm getting, <laughs> you remember that, Dave? <laughs> yeah, that's when I realized I don't really know what's going on because there's clearly more than one simple process here. But what we want to figure out here, again, is our, if you sample these in your erosional corridors, because sometimes they, they appear to be a good sampling media, but what, what are they, what do they actually represent? You know, do these represent a, an erosional remnant of your relatively pristine tills, or are these something that's been you know, brought down from the top of the ice or remobilized a kilometer or something? Well, we're, we're not too sure on that. Uh, and some Patrick's, um, both Patrick and Grayson's samples are, are currently being run right now, so they don't have a lot of the results back. But Patrick did do some uh, grain size analysis of some of the samples he collected. So, uh, Purple, yeah, these ones here were taken from the till blanket, and these ones here were taken from the erosional corridor. And this is a plot of uh, percent, and this is your grain size. So what you see here, and this is 500 micron, this is two millimeter, that's 125 micron, but what you really see here is there's a pretty strong loss of fines in those erosional corridors. So the question that sort of raises for me is that if there was enough fluid or enough disturbance of these glacial sediments to remove that much of the fines. How much movement was involved with this, you know? And is this movement, is it toward the center, I mean, towards the Esker system, the center of the corridor, or is there, or there also a down ice component to this? So, you know, have these been moved? If so, how much? And, you know, and if there's, you know, if you can modify their grain size by that much, you know, what else is being changed? How would this affect your chem counts? So I'm looking forward to see what uh, Patrick and Brent come up with for that. Uh, another thing we're doing, this one's being done south of Lac de Grau. This is with uh, Martin Ross's group at University of Waterloo. 
and they're looking at uh, bedrock topographic and tilt thickness controls on contrasting tilt dispersal patterns for kimberlites. So they're looking at um, a few things. What the makers are looking at is some kim trains that occur in a drumlin field. And again, this, this work was made possible due to the uh, access to the HW drilling data set uh, from Dominion and North Arrow as well as field assistance from them. So, um, oh, ooh, this is fancy, I don't know what this. Okay. So they have one indicator train here coming off of two Kimberlites there, and there's some other anomalies here. And so the one ice direction is there, but they think that the initial ice direction is going that way, and then remobilize this for a phantom cessed train. I'm usually not a big fan of that explanation, but here they actually, especially with the change in lithology, there's pebble counts backing this up and all that. So in this case, I think uh, I think that's what's going on here. Okay, so patient, their, their work is that the, uh, the Kim dispersion from the younger flow from known Kim is stronger at surface and weak at depth and thin till. So this contrasts what we were seeing over in other areas we were studying. We were seeing, uh, you know, we were seeing stronger Kim counts at depth. Um, and they say that the Kim patterns in the drumlin fields are best explained by considering the full ice history. So they, again, with the, the possible re-entrainment there. And one thing they didn't they, they did find is they were finding higher kin counts in the middle of some of the drumlins. So what they think this may be, this might be till stratigraphy preserved in the drumlins. And if that's the case, that makes a pretty strong case for drumlins being an erosional feature in this area. But it also sort of raises the possibility that if you are grabbing samples in those areas and you're not recognized that there's stratigraphy present, that could certainly uh, make it difficult to interpret what's going on. Another really quick study we did. Um, we did three short transects. This was um, some. This is the, some of the Dave Sacco and Rob McKillop did with their mapping work, and they grabbed some samples on the top of the tilt plane as well as down more in a valley there that we think there might be possible lake sediment influence. And what we see there was uh, the pretty pretty strong increase in finds down or by the old lake shores there. So this might be, you know, and, and the tills all look fairly similar. So this again, we're saying this is evidence for potentially prior to being lake sediments and tills. Um, I'm not sure why, but the transect up that had two samples, the other transects had more, but this is the figure I have. <laughs> so, and back on the cryoturbation, um, as I mentioned before, what, what's the rate of this? Well, this is a boulder we saw this summer. It had a bit of dirt on it, but it was getting heaped up faster than vegetation could grow. So again, what's the time scale for you know, how long does it take to completely churn up your till column and grind it back into itself at the surface? All right, we're getting close to the end here. So this, we're gonna, the last part here is on some of the studies we did that are more geared towards target discrimination. And the, so the basic idea here was that if you, so you fly your, your geophysics and you have uh, 25 anomalies or maybe more of your metasets, but you're only gonna drill 10 of them. How do, you, how do you pick which ones to drill? Maybe there's some quick and easy things you can do in the field that would give you more layers of information to work with for that. So one of the first ones we did was with Erica Kayer and Peter Winterburn. Uh, and it was over the D018 Kimberlite. And so they did uh, soil sampling, a bunch of geochem analyses, um, as well as some uh, soil gas work. And so here's DO18, there's DO27, this is a, a, a helicopter here. And what I just want to point out here is that at the top, it's really nice you know, frost boils here. And down at the bottom of this hill here, it's mostly post-glacial sediments. So we were trying to see a buried kimberlite in soil samples. Uh, here's some four acid data. And we, you, know, you see some of the kimberlite, but a lot of places didn't. But the dispersal train on the top part of the slope there, you know, that, that showed quite nicely. So there's the four acid again, and here is chromium done with a portable XRF. It actually works not bad. Uh, and here is some soil gas work, but again, there seems to be something to the light benzene there from the soil gas work. But unfortunately, we're not able to pursue this any further because the lab that does that, um, they changed their policies and they decided they would no longer give me raw data. They would just give me their prepared final product. I'm not sure why. I think they didn't like our interpretations of it, but they basically only give us that the bullseye target sort of thing, which is too bad because it was there may have been something to that. So, but if you take your oh, sorry, these are all B horizon soil samples. 
So they're, they're quite quick to do. But if you take those soil samples and put in a pellet and zap with your XRF and you sum uh, a package of your Kimberley Pathfinder elements here, you get this. So, you know, these dispersal patterns and the anomaly on top of, of the U18 showed up as well with you know, equivalently in a portable XRF as with your four acid stuff. So a four acid sample we can take, you know, take a few weeks to get back from the lab. So if you are looking to do some evaluation quite quickly, a portable XRF, uh, it does work for that. I, I didn't think it would work because my experience with portable XRFs hasn't been that great, but I think it was um, used for different purposes and it was about a decade ago. So the technology appears to have moved on. <coughs> So, and uh, Andrew Wickham was doing continuation of sort of work based out of Kelvin Camp. Um, and one of the things you saw there, um, correctly if I get this wrong, Andrew, uh, but you're seeing that the 150 to 100 micron size fraction in your soil samples was enriched in your Kimberlite Pathfinder elements as well as Kim fragments? Uh, we didn't do Kim fragments. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 The geochemistry is suggesting that there are. Oh, okay. I was wondering if I added that in an error there. So that, that appears to be a, a, a useful technique, and you know, in, in some cases, it seems to be picking up a dispersal signal where you know where there's where the kings are pretty much dead. So it was able to generate a geochemical anomaly over not over the base. Um, yes, yeah, for those who are too familiar with Kelvin, this is the part here that that sub crops. This is this is going down deeper there. So there is some anomaly there, but there's also some anomalies there. So the the geochem data is uh, a little. Uh, a little, little trickier to interpret. Uh, something else we worked on with, uh, with Peter Winterberg um, and Bianca Phillips at um, and, uh, UBC there is doing microbial fingerprinting of uh, soil bacteria. I remember when, when Peter first pitched this to me, I, uh, I thought it was, <laughs> I didn't think it was going to work. It sounds like something from Star Trek. Uh, and I, I thought it was going to be incredibly expensive too, but then when I found out the cost, I don't remember it is off the top of my head, but it's not prohibitively expensive. Uh, so I figured, why not? Let's try it and see what happens. It's probably not going to work anyway. Well, it, it sort of does work, actually. So there's two aspects of this. The one we were focused, that was focused on this was doing RNA sequencing. Uh, and what that does is it gives you the number of species. And what I haven't seen the data for, I'm not sure if we've done it, is if you do the DNA sequencing, it can, um, that gives you, can tell you what they're eating sort of what functional group they're, they're using to, uh, to process, to do whatever they do to various trace elements. Uh, so we were able to see pretty distinct signatures between background and kimberlites. Uh, in some cases, it appears to see through bedrock. So the lab works fairly routine and somewhat cost it. It's fairly cost effective too, but the real question is what are, what are we actually seeing here? What are we actually measuring? So here's what the data looks like. So this is the number of RNA reads they do. And, and the, um, the red is above your kimberlite, and your blue is above, or sorry, background and down ice. And this is the number of species they find. So it's a pretty, a pretty clear break there, where it's, there is definitely a decrease in diversity above the kimberlites. And so it sort of looks like this at DO18, where the, 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 the larger dots are decreasing diversity. So it, actually highlights above the pipe fairly well. Um, and over at Kelvin, it, it picks up the deep part of Kelvin quite well. I'd like to see a little more data around here to see, or to see where that actually sort of, where that signal dies off. But I'm, we don't have a great handle on what's actually driving this though. They, they don't think it's trace element. Um, I wonder if it's just some sort of, uh, maybe they're feeding off of, or maybe it's driven by uh, gases associated with the breakdown of sort of, you know, matrix, ultra matrix sort of stuff. So if this is the case, it'd be pretty good to do it over, you know, maybe just go sample across some McKenzie dikes and yellow and other 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 matrix, ultra matrix rocks and see if we get a, a signal from that as well. Because I mean, this this is really cool stuff, but I mean, like, you know, what's a false positive look like? Like, what's a false negative? Where does it work? Where it doesn't work? It's still still pretty. Uh, I mean, we still don't have a great handle on that, but it, it's pretty cool. So. So going forward, hopefully, uh, I think Bianca wants to carry this work on. So I'd like to try this over a few more, uh, a few more pipes up in the territory. So if you have uh, a subaerial pipe, we uh, get in touch with me if you want to see what's done there. We'd be keen to try it out. Uh, something else we did for fiber discrimination was we acquired some um, EM data. I, I 
say V10 here, but I think it was Digim. Uh, Digim's the torpedo, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this was, <laughs> we did not get V10. We got Digim. We didn't have, we didn't have the... V10's the a close thing. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't have the big dream catch run. Yeah, it, definitely, it was definitely the torpedo. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so what the Revenant Mag does is it, this is a little over my head here, but it seems to show areas with similar magnetic alignment. <coughs> And it's, it, can be, it can help sort anomalies in geophysically noisy environments. So what, the way they do this is you compare your mag susceptibility to your EM-derived susceptibility. And by applying a Helbig analysis with an APWP investigation, you can estimate the direction of your remnants vector. So but what that translates into is that in, Intrusions of the same you know, age that were set to the same uh, the same magnetic pole should point in the same direction. So here, this was over uh, this data here was over Big Blue, I believe. And so here is the EM der no, this is the mag derived susceptibility, this is the EM derived susceptibility, and here's the difference here. It actually shows you know shows the Kimberlite quite nicely. Uh, here's what this data looks like in a, in a messier area where they use it to flag several clusters of anomalies that have uh, remnants associated with ages of known <coughs> Kimberlites in the area. And this can be applied to old data as well. So, um, I don't know, it seems to work. It's what it's over my head, but when he presents the stuff, geophysicists from companies seem to be quite interested in talking about it afterwards. And, I think he's got some work doing it for some people, I'm not sure, but it, yeah, so it, I say, if you have the data that's lying around, it's just a reprocessing exercise, so. And this is, I think, the last thing I'm going to talk about here quickly. Uh, we were doing some uh, hyperspectral drill core studies, um, and so we did some, some logging with them. You're able to pick up some lithologies and kimberlites that you can't, and changes in matrix that you can't pick out with, your, with the naked eye very easily. Uh, it's very good for estimating uh, dilution. Over here, some work we did on some gold drill core, it was able to easily identify some of the, the fungi or other sodium micas that are associated with gold mineralizations. They all kind of look the same in the core, but with this, you can highlight, hey, that this is the phase associated with the gold here. Uh, the other thing we have to do with them as well is, this is an open report, 2018-12. They were looking at hydration fronts coming off of kimberlites, and there appears to be detectable hydration fronts coming off of kimberlites. Um, the problem with that is, is that you know, if it comes off your kimberlites, it's probably also coming off of your kimberlite dikes as well. So it's, it's not just one pipe giving a signal. signal. It's, a very, it's a whole complex of stuff doing that. And the other thing too is what else can generate these hydration fronts? We don't, you know, would, uh, you know, would uh, some late stage pegmatite things do the same thing? So again, what's your false positive? What's, when is this appropriate? But the idea behind this is that if you were to uh, miss a kimberlite by 10 meters of the drill hole and you get a strong hydration anomaly, and it may, it may suggest it's worth doing the hole. So, okay, so we're wrapping up now. So I guess, to summarize the implications of this work here, I guess one of the things to consider is, you know, do you have, what's the adequate surficial coverage and resolution for your program needs? Is it one to 10K, one to 25K? Uh, I think there's a lot of value in going in, especially in complex areas, and having detailed surficial mapping done to, to, so you can interpret old samples as well as plan new ones more efficiently. Uh, other thing is, again, what are your maps showing? You know, is it inf inferred thickness, or is it sort of genetic units with different affinity affinities for chemtrain preservation? Uh, other thing, too, is what are you sampling? Is this a mix of cryotribated post-glacial lake sets? Uh, are you sampling the last phase of ice advance that didn't pick up any kims? Are you sampling highly washed hills from erosional corridors? So, uh, the glacial history can be complex, it can be simple. So, recognize which environment you're in and sample appropriately, considering ice direction, tilt thickness, post glacial southern influence, uh, cryo turbation as well. Um, yeah, so kim trains can be complex, and in some cases, they may be obscured by post glacial processes. It'd be really cool to go back to that copper mine area and do uh, a much tighter overburden drilling grid to see if some of those anomalies at depth, if those are just one-offs, or if there actually is sort of some uh, continuation of those. Uh, it also sort of remind people that we have these beautiful 100 meter space mag data sets that are uh, able, that are up there for your base maps. 
Um, yeah, if you have old data lying around, consider some of that remnant mag work. It can show anomalies of the same generation. So if you've got one pipe in the area, maybe this can highlight other pipes from the same generation. Uh, there seems to be a fair bit of promise for soil and microbial sampling of target discrimination. Uh, your portable XRFs, those appear to be useful for this kind of field work. And hyperspectral core analysis could show a near miss. And before I go here, I would just like to remind everybody that the 12th International Kimberlake Conference is in Yellowknife on in August 2021. There. 59 minutes. Wow. So. I guess we have time for a question or two. <laughs> well, I guess I got it all covered then. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the DOI team, DOI 27 um, indicator training, it's been a while, but um, I think there's an ESCO to the uh, just to the west that, that I always fall as a reason okay. that, that the indicator train got disturbed. Oh, when you go out in the field, you can see that the sand mm -hmm. sh shows up in the topography. You can see that there. You no, know, and they, the guys doing the model never mentioned that, but yeah. I mean, there's, when you get in the valley there, there's definitely a lot of post glacial, a lot of sand. Yeah, I, there. I always thought that that was, it was wiped out mainly for that reason. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was, I was deglaciation. I was wondering why there wasn't. Was there that deglaciation? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you see that uh, south of the lake, sort of more in the HW Kaufman area. You, you don't see a lot of well preserved eskers there, but you see a lot of small remnants of them. Yeah. So you kind of wonder, you know, where did a lot of material go? So maybe that's a similar situation there. Do you have the slide of the south <coughs> copper mine? Oh yeah, take yeah. it all. It's, it's in here. This is a map. I'm pretty sure I can figure it. <laughs> Almost the same. I'm not as good at computers as I used to be, and when they try to get me to do database stuff at work, I mean, what I like to tell them is I tell them that I need my wife's help with Facebook, <laughs> and that I find that gets it across quite well. Yeah. Close. <laughs> That's not incorrect, is it? <laughs> the one with the drawer. I think that you had it. The one with the Oh, sorry, the train with the drawer. Oh, we were trying to wrestle the printer reinstall yesterday. Ooh. Oh, here, this one there. No, no, that's the Oh, here, the yeah. South Copper Mine. Those ones there. Oh, sorry, Copper Mine. Okay. Um, you, you had it, and then you went off it. Oh, did I? Okay. Um, keep going up. Yeah, that's one. Yeah, that's one. Oh, this, yeah, this one the ones there. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, spend $10 million here. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> The, uh, yeah, so you're, 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 even though we were only sampling the surface to them, mm -hmm. you're still picking up exactly what we had. We, we had not this was um, Pat's Lake, that's yep. Phil's Lake, we named them because blah, or some glass lake that they didn't have to work here. Yeah, so we, we, we thought, oh, it's here. You know, just, mm -hmm. But we saw that in the surface. Oh, did you? We found diamonds here. We, I done a hand dug a, a grave for myself because after the show, someone's been to me. Anyway, um, you, you're getting exactly the same results. Go, go to oh, the um, surface go, data. Yeah, go huh. to the um, go to the uh, probability. Which, you know, have a couple of two more slides on this. So even at this one to one point five, you didn't you still see, you didn't see an outlier. Yeah. And even though we're not getting the thousands that you're getting, it's still an omelet, So that's all that counts. Yeah. And, you know, G counts. That's all that counts. Well, I guess it's only G right. And the population. Well, that's what we're seeing. You know, you're seeing it much better. Yeah. Some of you don't see it very well here. But if you can pick up the same yeah. anomaly without having to mobilize the drone, exactly. you know, that's great. So we're seeing the same thing. Yeah. yeah. It's very interesting. Well, I think what that kind of shows too is that, um, you know, when, you know, you can be standing here on a, a good sampling media, yeah. and you can be at the door there and it's garbage. So I think a lot of that comes into well, well, the, the, cry, the cryogenation goes down to the top of the permafrost and it's never very far away. I, mean, I think I hit it digging that grave, I hit it at about this deep. I think the <laughs> permafrost apparently used to be lower thousands of years ago yeah. when I was warmer, so it's been variable, but yeah. But that's good to know that if you actually, if you actually sample properly, you can get some very similar yeah. results as you're so going. That's awesome. Yeah. And, yeah, and that particular sample of the diamonds, yeah. 300 pounds. Okay. Oh. 
Yeah, see, so the surface samples we got were pretty null, and we, we did yeah. some surface sampling there as well as part of that. But you're, in that data you're seeing it, you've you got to you got to break in the probability plot. That's an anomaly. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a <laughs> well, some of the shovel is just as good as the drill. Yeah. Yeah. Well, are you aware that the Hornet RC drill fragments indicators and diamonds? And so they have fragments indicators and diamonds. Mm -hmm. And therefore, artificially increases the diamond counts, mm -hmm. but also decreases the size distribution. No okay. size frequency distribution. Um, we thought that may have. We were wondering about that, but this kind of thing where there wasn't really a lot we could do with it, or a lot we could do about that. But yeah, it's definitely something to be aware of when you're doing the data. Because it's, uh, yeah, it's it's not directly comparable to other data. That's for sure. Yeah. What was for your for your Kim samples? What was your sample size? Um, for the drill, it was um, 1.5 meters of about yay big, so they were about. You didn't split. Like, I would say about 20 pounds ish, like 20 pound kind of thing. I'm not no, sure. No, that's off the de de bearing one. Yeah, yeah. I'd have to look it, it up. I don't know. I don't make any But yeah, it, it was a 1.5 meter rock, is what we were doing. It was about three and a half, three and a half inch diameter. It went in a bag. You usually get one, sometimes two, if they're small in a bucket. There were a lot of buckets. You know, and out, out of about 20 trains, that was the only one that gave us diamonds. Even, even when we did RC drilling, yeah. Dan and I was a diary. We couldn't find any, you know, four carat ton pipes, we couldn't find any diamonds. In, in, in those sort of same size samples. You know? Well, it's funny how uh, some, some Kimberleys will have, you know, a nice train, somehow, you know, it's kind of scary. Well, 418, yeah, 81547, we, we, we drilled 200 meters mm -hmm. down through the till, sampling every meter, and no train. <laughs> and um, not all Kimberlies will give a train, right? A, a, a21 years, it, it depends on the last location. Yeah. It also depends on the nature of the Kimberley. So the gunners can be reacted out to or not there, etc., etc. So not all Kimberlies deliver indicator mode. That's sort of the, the challenge, but also also the opportunity, I think, mm -hmm. in the Northwest Territories. There's, I think there's uh, still a fair bit to be found there. There are, are new discoveries coming up, which is nice, so it's good. Yeah, so the only reason it can be like with indicators or shared indicators during a particular place or history is if there's an erosion. Mm -hmm. If they don't get eroded, they don't. So, you know, if they, get, if they eroded in the last glaciation and that hole fills with till, it doesn't get eroded. And we're seeing that with, um, I didn't mention here, but there's also some work done looking at the data over, over top of Big Blue, where it's up on that big right. and high there. There's, there wasn't much of a trend that seemed to be coming off of that. But there was evidence for early ice advance being preserved on, on the lee side, and dig down ice about them as well at the depth. So. so the big challenge of indicator trains is they seem to get to get to within, say, a four square, four square K block mm -hmm. area of where the Kimberlake probably is. Yeah. But it doesn't need the drill holes. Um, you know, so we were just saturating geophysics in that four square you can call on with a block and drilling it in the mood. And sometimes you did and sometimes you didn't. Well that, that's sort of the, the problem with the RC drilling is that you know you have to convince somebody that you want to spend two million bucks to not drill your targets. You know, that's not yeah. always an easy sell. No. Yeah, and you know I yeah, you got to wonder what's a better use of money. Is it is it doing a regional RC yeah, grid, or is it just going in and getting drilling everything? You know, we use sonic rigs and RC rigs to follow trains at the lakes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, they're just too expensive. They, you run out of money really quick. Yeah, yeah. there's a you know a hard with a sledge can it's pretty efficient, yeah. but it's still it's still pretty costly. Yeah. yeah. So no, I, I don't plan on doing any more uh, any more overversion drilling programs like that. I don't think I, I don't think I want to go through. Get, get a permit again for that. But. And, and then half the time the lakes are some sort of you know, meltwater event, so mm -hmm. that's all it tells you is, oh, the train's gone because there's a lake there. We, we actually hit some lakes with the RC rig, and we you know, were drilling some holes, this water just coming up everywhere, we didn't know what was going on, and then we, we go back to spot those holes in the summer, and like, oh yeah, that was, it wasn't a big lake, yeah, that was, that was the water. Yeah, the heart was good, right? It was nice, I liked it. Good, good. It, uh, it performed as advertised, which was nice. Can you, can you say a few more words about the official maps that were made? What are the unit, like, I guess it's texture mapping, but how do they assign that unit to it? 
Um, do you have to the map and just what are some units? Oh, okay. Well, that would be mapping out, they would be doing uh, areas where you have um, you know, concentrations in one, one thing. Uh, they'd be mapping glacial fluvial stuff. You know, esters, various different faces of that. They'd be mapping out your so area. So the esters are probably the one thing I could recognize on. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but I just wonder how to find it. So can you pull up that map? Yep. The nice, the nice blurry map. Yeah. Was it blurry? Uh, I think a little. Well, from my point, not from what I'm seeing, is where we can end up with. So the the um well, actually I was interested in the ones that the raw ones you showed before this. Oh, okay. One before that. So oh. this is your this is an interpretation of this here, you. yeah. Yeah. So with those units, the units that we were using, um, they are a slightly modified version of what the GSC is doing. We okay. added a few more elements to capture sort of the areas where you think there's high disturbances or, you know, or lots of boulder concentration, that kind of stuff. But, but it's compatible with the, the mapping that all the new GAC products have been. So. Mm -hmm. And it's just from the texture of the surface, I mean, so the elevator, the relief on it? Yeah, relief as well as uh, air photo and right. sap photo analysis. And there was, again, there was some ground truth into them. I think they probably had about like a day or two in each map sheet on the ground. So, I mean, not nearly enough time on the ground, I think. Well, I mean, it would be always nice to get more, but you know, if you came down the cost, it would be a church for the yeah. Well. yeah, I think the, uh, I mean, I'd love to see a huge traditional mapping campaign to cover those proper with uh, traditional maps, but I think the uh, remote generator product is how things are going. And the, um, at least the Palmer there, they, they've covered a huge chunk of the slave for various companies. So they, they have a pretty good knowledge base for what they can expect where and all that. So for them, it's, this sort of works fairly routine. They seem to be good products. It's uh, certainly helpful if you're trying to sort through the old kid data. Okay. Any more questions? Any more um, comment on ESCAs? You know, mm -hmm. Obviously, you can, some ESCAs you can, they seem continuous over a thousand kilometers. Mm -hmm. some, so I haven't seen those ones. That's why I say what we saw. Well, you know, the legend here, here is that Chuck and Stu followed an ESCA mm -hmm. in the 700Ks. And Sample over the space of eight years and mm -hmm. indicators from, from the Mackenzie River to Landon Brown the indicators stopped here, and that's how this all was all found. And that's, that's the legend. And what, you know, there's been a long argument where they're sampling many, many trains, but in this sample spacing, which is about 30 kilometers, it, there was yeah. a continuous indicator train to you got to Landon Brown and stopped. Yep. That's the legend. Um, <coughs> you know, I, I think. Every company that went there had a chance to sample the eskers of the slave. And you do see they are a very nice way of lighting up the fields. Yep. Um, and they go, you know, they go they're, they're at least in the 30, 40, 50, 60 kilometer range. Yeah, and that's, it. that's why we want lighting up the fields. This is why we want to do a second round of that eskers. Mm -hmm. It might even, even some of it might even be in the kid database just for the kids. But I think, you know, in terms of you know the 700 kilometer transect there, I'd like to think that maybe some other Kimberley cluster is present. That's possible. Well, I, I guess that's what the Black Ollie Ollie Bridge is doing. But anyway, yeah, the, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, there yeah. are other Kimberley fields along the way, but they don't have the mm -hmm. same. Like, I mean, all the drill they drill up around 30 Kimberley so the show there, so, which is a lot. It's a lot of people don't know that that's there. So. Yeah. Like I, I, we were looking at some indicator data for the Horn Plateau area, and it's. A lot of people saying these came from the slaves. Like, well, you know, we have a Kimberley field like adjacent to here. Why do we need to jump through all these all these hoops for this? You know? Unfortunately, the chemistry is matching, so they have matching. So I'm, I'm, they have to find there is a Kimberley in that field, is and then so far not even diamonds. Um, yeah. So that's not there's one out there that has it, or it came from the slave. Yeah. My my guess is you know they seem to form mostly mag. So the, the ones that respond to mag may not be the right the generation that has a good indicator. To Take, take a favorite more drilling, sort that one out. So. 
but there's definitely kilometer scale things going on in these really long escas. Mm -hmm. But they must be late in their history, you see. They, they must start off being really long. And then as, as things, as, as they fill up their tunnel or um, the place yeah. retreats, local things happen. So yeah, yeah. I, I think I have my head wrapped around short transport as it's moving back. But I don't have a good feel at all for how long that could potentially be sourced from for longer yeah. transport. So, so I say the evidence we've seen supports short. I'm not totally sold on it yet. And that's where you know, hopefully the new uh, PhD will yield something from that. So, if it's tough, because yeah, you seem to see evidence for, for both processes. Yeah, I'm over in Finland now using Eskers and picking up fields from tens of kilometers away. So. Yeah. Oh, and when we start seeing the transport of bedrock clasts along escrow systems for longer distances, yeah. that's obviously being transported at that distance, you know. Okay, I have to interfere here because we are running over time. And also, I'm booked at, we're booked at 7.15 in the Linux pub, so if we want to have beers, we'd better rush to the pub. <laughs> and uh, we thank Sarah um, for your presentation. For